We have 10 minutes. I think it's a very hot topic. Let me start with a short story about fructose. In Germany, we had fructose as a sugar allowed for diabetics, and we have just terminated that after 20 years of fight because of consequence. If you say sugar is okay for diabetics because it doesn't need insulin to be transported, this was the argument in the 60s, then everybody who goes to somebody who's diabetic brings him a chocolate or whatever is sweetened with fructose. And I can tell you this is not good because fructose does increase blood sugar, even though it does have more than other sugars but it does increase blood sugar. So uh, I'm quite reserved about the thing with sugar. I think it's correct, as you showed it. it it's, it's not more toxic than anything else, and it's associated with diabetes only in the context of obesity. But uh, still, it's, uh, it's not a good sugar for diabetics. OK, but this was my comment. Now I would like to ask you for comments from the public or discussion, please. Do we have a microphone? Hi, Tom Oliver from okay. Toronto. Bernadette, I had a quick question for you. Uh, do you use, do you consider the strains of animals, which when you do the toxicology studies, because uh, that would be a question for you, and the question for uh, Dr. Peters is what kind of sweetener was, what was the artificial sweetener in your study? Uh, yes, in terms of uh, the strain, again, a lot of times it is based on the pharmacokinetics and which is most relevant in terms of comparative to the to humans, but um, for within, so so yes, and also just even which species would be used for the final assessment of the Noel that would also be determined by the the comparative toxicokinetics. Okay. Other question? Okay. Sorry, for Dr. Peters, you showed a study with water versus soft drinks. So what was right. the sweetener in that soft drink? The answer is, is yes. It was um, basically every one of the sweeteners that's currently available on the market that's present in beverages was on the table for people to select from. So it included aspartame, ACE-K, sucralose, uh, stevia, et cetera. Yes, Saul Katz from Solo GI Nutrition. Um, in developing products for people with diabetes, uh, it's my belief that, and I'm not a scientist, um, but I've been in the industry for quite a while. It's my belief that it's better to provide carbohydrates uh, in the food product. We, we develop nutrition bars um, that are the, where the entire product is clinically valid to be very low glycemic, and ours are between 23 and uh, uh, 35, uh, without sugar alcohols or artificial sweeteners, because I, I think people with diabetes need energy too, and not sugar alcohols too bind fat and protein together and not give them energy to get up and exercise. Uh, so I'd be interested in your comments on that. Yes. So um, who, who wants to answer? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I suppose I don't really follow the point about not having the artificial sweetener because obviously you get energy from other other things. I mean, the primary role of the replacement of uh, use of, of artificial sweeteners or high intensity sweeteners is to reduce the amount of sucrose, the amount of sugar, not necessarily, is not effective to necessarily reduce complex carbohydrates. So um, it, that logic didn't quite follow. Well, I think other companies prefer to dampen the glycemic response using chemically altered carbohydrates that don't contribute energy and pass, are, are designed to pass through the body and in the process cause a laxative effect or stomach upset. So I'd rather give people real food that's released more slowly, so that, which releases the sugars more slowly so they have energy without the upset. Okay, I, th I think this is a topic of the next session, so we, we might not discuss it here. And carbohydrate is not an essential nutrient, by the way, for humans and other animals, while fat and protein is. But anyway, I think the gentleman here was the next for the question. Thank you. I, I think you've provided some reasonable evidence that um, non-nutritive sweeteners are associated with various adverse health outcomes, and there's a few theories as to why. 
but in particular in observational studies, I'm just thinking guilt by association is a potential explanation and none of you really touched on it, so I'd be interested in your thoughts about that. Well, the point of my presentation was to show no adverse effects. <laughs> okay. Um, Angela? Uh, Angela Rivelli, Naples, Italy. A question for uh, to look uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, fructose. Uh, you uh, have said that uh, uh, fructose, one of the main negative effects, uh, possible negative effects of fructose is on blood lipids, not on blood glucose and so on. Especially when uh, uh, the amount of fructose is relatively, relatively high. How much is this uh, amount? And uh, uh, do you believe that it's possible in the real life uh, uh, easily to get this amount? especially for some uh, uh, people, uh, young people, and so on. OK, the first, the, it, it's going to, the, the, the amount of fructose at which you will start observing potentially adverse uh, changes in risk factors varies a lot from one individual to another. It depends mainly on physical activity. For somebody who is physically active, the, and athletes can have very high sugar intake without any adverse metabolic effects. Now, in, uh, in uh, sedentary people, uh, the first effects is, uh, are observed with daily intakes above 50 to 60 grams, pure fructose. Would be about 100 and, 100 and 120 Gram sugar. Can I, can, can I just say something? Maybe I may add there also a point. Look, look specifically says with pure fructose. Now, real lives in that in daily life we humans do not consume pure fructose. Uh, pure fructose has other effects. If you have more than thirty-five grams as a bolus intake, you may react with diarrhea. If you have a little bit of glucose in it to addition, you get no diarrhea. But also the metabolism is different. If you look to animal studies that are done on pure fructose compared to sucrose, you see very detrimental effects of high intakes of pure fructose. But if you have equal amounts of sucrose, which is half less fructose, but the same amount of energy, these negative effects disappear. So at the end, it comes to doses. And uh, we have done, and, and Wim, Wim is also here, one of my first studies was mimicking to the France cycling. We, we had cyclists up to 6,500 kilocalories per day in a respiration chamber. We controlled everything. They were on high sucrose intakes and high fructose intakes, and they had no effect whatsoever on their lipids that was negative simply because they burn all the calories. So it depends on physical activity, and it depends on the total amount related to your normal energy turnover. Thanks. Okay. Just a quick oh, question. Well, actually, I, I wanted to come back to the question that was asked before because I, I was, have been thinking about what you meant by guilt by association. I'm assuming you're, you're talking about whether or not one can discern a hazard based on observational studies, right? And I've, you've actually heard one of the speakers here say you cannot do that. Okay, well, that, it's an interesting idea. It tends to show up in communities in the nutrition world. It certainly doesn't show up in other lifestyle areas, in pharmaceuticals or in chemicals. Happens all the time. I mean, the classic example is smoking and lung cancer. There wasn't any biology of smoking and lung cancer back when we decided that smoking causes lung cancer solely on the epidemiology. And you can say, well, it was a different epidemic. No, but the bottom, we're talking about a methodological claim here that you can't do it. Well, of course you can. What the, it doesn't make it easy, it doesn't make it straightforward. And what you have seen in the public health and epidemiology community over time is a change in what is required for a determination of causation in terms of magnitudes of effect, presence or lack of presence of dose response, and the requirement for a biologic mechanism. 
So you've seen a change in standards over time. Let me give you an example. In 1964, when smoking and was looked at in terms of causality, in terms of lung cancer, no claim, it wasn't just lung cancer, they were looking at a variety of cancers, no claim of causation was made without a relative risk of three in the studies. In the 1980s, that had come down to two. And now we're in a very different world in which people are actually claiming that things like that 1.12 is causal. Well, it's not that you can absolutely refute that. It's just that the, the alternatives become so much more prominent the closer you get to one. The alternative explanations, residual confounding, real confounding, bias, et cetera. So I don't know if that helps answer your question, but it sort of puts it in the context of what, what you meant. So anyway, I just wanted to say that. Uh, thanks. I think there is time for one short question because John gets very nervous back there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make it really quick. One thing that I think is missing from the research at the moment is what happens when a doctor says reduce sugar sweetened soft drink, eat artificial sweetened soft drink if you'd like. All right. What happens when you cut those calories? Maybe it's one can or two cans a day, maybe that's 120, 250 calories. What happens to the rest of the diet? What replaces those calories? Is it that choice between the, you know, that the Diet Coke is now accompanied by a packet of chips and you've increased the saturated fat and the sodium and other things? So why aren't we hearing this research? Why aren't we analysing the rest of the diet? Well, I know at least one study that has been done on stevia, saccharin, and cyclamate, where they look to, uh, to uh, food intake uh, compared to sugar-sweetened beverage. And those who had the, uh, the sweetened beverages had a reduced food intake based on 24-hour measurements over time. I think it was a week or two weeks that they measured that. And it was published uh, two years ago, I think. It was one of the first studies on stevia and the concern that stevia as the new natural sweetener might increase food intake. But that was not shown. There was a reduced energy intake uh, overall. So se seemingly, in, at least in that study, there was, there was no compensation that people who had uh, such a drink were taking something else. The literature is kind of a mess on this point. <clears throat> it's basically the context in which the study is being done. I mean, for example, in our study where people were intentionally trying to lose weight, they're cognitively basically trying to not compensate. Then you have other studies where they're just swapping out beverages when people may or may not compensate. I think the answer is in the literature all over the map in terms of what's been seen. And I don't know that there's any really clear sense of it. Adam Janowski published a paper recently looking at diet quality index and found that people who consumed artificially sweet beverages on, uh, on a regular basis actually had a higher diet quality index. But you know, it's potentially because they were paying attention to their diet. And this is just one of the factors that they were doing to try to improve their diet. So they're improving other things at the same time. So I think it's a legitimate question. That's why I was saying that it's really important that we get at these cognitive effects and understand what people are doing with these when they have the can and they're looking at the nutrition information and it says zero calories. <clears throat> what does that give me license to do? <laughs> okay, I think we have to come to an end. There are many open... Please go discuss with the speaker directly. I mean, all this craving business and so still to address and there are many aspects. Thanks a lot to the excellent speakers I think who were really very endowed.